The Bible is God speaking to me. I am what the Word of God says I am. I can do what the Word of God says I can do. I have what the Word of God says I possess. I am a believer, not a doubter. My mind is renewed with the Word. Therefore, I'm thinking those thoughts that please my Father. I'm walking by faith and not by sight. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, we who have chosen to say that God's Word will be our constant pursuit, we're setting ourselves up to be blessed. According to Matthew 6.33, the Bible declares, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. Now, last time we were together, we were talking about love is the way. And now that we're talking about love, still, this is part two, I'd ask that you would look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13 from the Amplified Version of your Bibles. And if you didn't have an Amplified Version, if you just went online to look and see if you could get a version of it added to your technologies, is what I call it, then you'd be able to read that and be prepared for what we're going to be talking about tonight. So we're going to be looking at love is the way. And what way? And where are we going? Love is the way to victory. You see, when you have chosen to be a person who walks in the love of God, you're going to have the manifestation of what you've been believing and thanking God for. Now, we're going to look at some scripture as a re, as it were, a rewind, or we're going to look at some review of scripture. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13 from the regular King James Version, and then we'll look at it from the Amplified Version, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm going to read it from the natural, regular, authorized King James Version of the Bible, and then we're going to read it from the Amplified Version. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, and the word charity is the word for love. That means the God kind of love. The Greek would say agape. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tingling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things, charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Now someone would say, well, he's saying that charity or love is the greatest thought of all the things that God could acknowledge in Scripture. In other words, that charity is greater than faith, charity is greater than hope. 
what Paul the Apostle by the Holy Ghost is saying here is that charity is the greatest motivation for all that we're told to do from Scripture. I have to put it in that sense of faith and love and hope being understood because faith is the way to please God according to Hebrews 11 6 then love should be the way we have our hearts affixed that we're going to use our faith so that our faith can produce marvelous results in our walk with the Lord faith has to be my motivation and now when we talk about motivation here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 13th chapter is sandwiched between the 12th chapter and the 14th chapter. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and in chapter 14, there, Paul the Apostle by the Holy Ghost is talking about the gifts of the Spirit. And in order for those manifestations or gifts of the Spirit to be fully in operation to bless the body of Christ and to allow people to see that God God really is good, the motivation of the gifts have to come from the position of love because love is the greatest motivator. Now, we know this based upon what we were talking about last week, that in 1 John chapter 4, the apostle John was talking about how that God is love. And since God is love, we ought to be thinking about as he is, so are we in this world. Now, we as the people of God should be expecting that the love of God is going to be how we choose to walk. Or we could say it this way, the love of God is the character that I choose to exhibit in all that I say and do. I want to be known for my character, my personality of love. And this love that I express has come from the Holy Spirit that shed the love of God abroad in my heart so that the character of my father is seen in what I say and what I do. I'm going to read the amplified version of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and pick up from where we left off last week. And this is the amplified version of the love of God in a real detailed description of how God's character should be seen and observed in our lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. If I can speak in tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, that reasoning, intentional, spiritual devotion, such as inspired by God's love for and in us, I am only a noisy gong or a clanging symbol. And if I have prophetic powers, the gift of interpreting the divine will and purpose, and understand all the secret truths and mysteries and possess all knowledge, and if I have sufficient faith so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, God's love in me, I am nothing, a useless nobody. Even if I dole out all that I have to the poor, I'll read that again. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 3 now. Even if I dole out all that I have to the poor in providing food, and if I surrender my body to be burned, or in order that I may glory, but have not love, God's love in me, I gain nothing. Love endures long and is patient and kind. Love never is envious nor boils over with jealousy, is not boastful or vainglorious, does not display itself haughtily. It is not conceited, arrogant, and inflated with pride. It is not rude, unmannerly, and does not act unbecomingly. Love, God's love in us, does not insist on its own rights or its own way. For it is not self-seeking. It is not touchy or fretful or resentful. It takes no account of an evil done to it. It pays no attention to a suffered wrong. It does not rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness, but rejoices when right and truth prevail. Love bears up under anything and everything that comes, is ever ready to believe the best of every person. Its hopes are faithless under all circumstances, and it endures everything without weakening. Love never fails, never fades out, or becomes obsolete, or comes to an end.
As for prophecy, the gift of interpreting the divine will and purpose, it will be fulfilled and pass away. As for tongues, they will be destroyed and cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. It will lose its value and be superseded by truth. For our knowledge is fragmentary, incomplete, and imperfect. And our prophecy or te our teaching is fragmentary, incomplete, and imperfect. But when the complete and perfect total comes, the incomplete and imperfect will vanish away, become antiquated, void, and superseded. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. Now that I have become a man, I have done with, I am done with childish ways and have put them aside. From now on, we are looking in a mirror that gives only a dim, blurred reflection of reality as in a riddle or an enigma. But when perfection comes, we shall see in reality the face-to-face. -face. Now I know in perfect imperfect, imperfectly. Here he goes again. Now I know in part imperfectly, but then I shall know and understand fully and clearly, even in the same manner as I have been fully and clearly known and understood by God. So faith, hope, and love abide. Faith, conviction, and belief respecting man's relation to God and divine things. Hope, joyful and confident expectation of eternal salvation. Love, true affection for God and man growing out of God's love for and in us, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now, this is the amplified version of the Bible, and I thought it was a really good way to look at how it describes love, the personality, the different parts of God's personality, so that we as the believers can say, I'm not going to be rude or unmannerly. As a believer, I walk in the love of God because as God is, so am I in this world. I believe the best of everyone. I choose to act in manner, in proper manner, with the way the Father has revealed himself unto me. For God loves humanity. And because he loves humanity and he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We are to walk in love believing that there are people that will respond to the love of God. Now the Bible also says the reason we love God is because he first loved us. That means love if it's really going to produce results in a person's life you're going to have to, by faith, love others. Did you know that God exercises his faith toward humanity? He believes that when he gave his love, his love would be responded to. And whosoever will believe on Jesus, the Father God has given unto them eternal life. I love the fact that we can exercise our faith in loving others. We can be kind. We don't have to pay attention to a suffered wrong. We don't have to be angry and mean and nasty and deplorable in speech or in attitude. When in reality, we can be the loving people of God. Now, does that mean that love does not have a, an ability to check wrong? Oh, yes, love will check wrong. Because when you really, really love, you're going to operate in the proper manner in good judgment. I love my wife. I love my children. I love what God is doing with our church. And because I do love, I do protect. But the protection is done with right judgment in line with God's word. I know that no weapon formed against us would ever prosper. And any tongue that rises up in judgment shall be condemned. I know that this is our inheritance in the Lord and our righteousness is of him. Now, I can treat then those who don't understand, even as Jesus treated those who didn't understand him. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But then Jesus also acknowledged that those who purpose to be bound up with wrongdoing, he encouraged them to become free from the sin. Why? Because Satan has no love for you.
Satan has no love for those who are inhabitants in the earth realm. He wants to see every human being decimated. Why? Because man was made in the likeness and the image of God. And we're to represent our father. We were made to fellowship with God. And when Adam sinned against God, he put himself in a position to have the heart of his spiritual stepfather, the devil, instead of having the heart of God, his heavenly father, that he once had. So we're going to look at some scriptures about love being the way. Let's talk. Let's look at John's gospel, chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. John's gospel, chapter 14, verses 34 and 35. We're just looking at love being the way. If I'm going to receive with my faith those things that I believe God for, then I'm going to have to have love in operation because love is what causes my faith to work. And when I start talking about believing God, I have to have a position of love so that I know what I'm believing for is in line with the will of God. And love does not work any ill towards its neighbor. I'm not going to believe God for your stuff, as it were, for your things. That would be coveting. That would be wrongdoing. And desiring that which is not mine is wrong. Paul the Apostle was very clear about fulfilling the law of God is walking in the love of God. So let's look at John's Gospel, chapter for, uh, chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. John, chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. Jesus said, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. So Jesus is acknowledging that people who don't know the Lord will be able to identify you as a Christian because of your outward expression of the love of God. Your love toward your brother and sister in the Lord puts you in a place where you can say, I really am a child of God because my actions of love prove that truly God is in me of a truth. So Jesus acknowledges we're to have the love of God in our lives, in our speech, and in our actions, in our attitude as we deal with one another in the body of Christ. Turn over to Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel, the 36th chapter, we'll look at verse 25 to 29. Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 25 to 39. Ezekiel chapter 36, and we'll look at verses 25 through 29. Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 25 through 39. I'm going to begin reading in verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. Now that he's talking about is the spirit of a person who is, at this time they were Old Testament people, and they had a heart, but their heart was like stone, like what the Ten Commandments were etched in. And the, the prophet Ezekiel is letting them know by the Spirit of God that God said, I'm going to give you a new heart, not a hard heart, not a heart that's <clears throat> excuse me, etched with the commandments of God. I'm going to give you a heart that's going to be supple, a heart that will be receptive, a heart that will be tender. I'm going to give you a heart that will know the character of God and allow you to be able to express the character of God. We're looking at Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26 now. <clears throat> a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. 
And you shall dwell in the land that I give, I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will also save you from all your uncleanness or uncleanliness. And I will call for the corn and will increase it and lay no famine upon you. Did you notice that God is informing his people that when you have that heart of love on the inside of you, that you'll not have lack, you'll have abundance, especially in this day and time in which we live. Having a heart of love causes you to stand out because far too many people are walking outside of the love of God. So, O oh believer, let it be known that your heart being expressed in the attitude of love allows for people to see and know that you must be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ for real. Let's look at another scripture, Jeremiah chapter 31, and we'll look at verses 33 and 34. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 33 and 34. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 33 and 34. We're talking about love, the way, is the way. <clears throat> and in, in saying that, we're talking about love is the way to victory. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 33 and 34. Here we go. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. Another way of saying, I'll put my law in your spirit. Inward parts. And write it in their hearts and will be their God, and they shall be my people. I'll read verse 33 again. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts, and write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Do you see how he said that his love will allow you to be free from the sin that you've committed in the past? He said in Jeremiah 31, verse 34, the latter part of verse 34, I will forgive their iniquity. Now, God says, I have forgiven you of your iniquity. Then don't keep bringing it up and trying to live after the past mistakes. Move on, move forward, allow yourself to grow in the love of God. And the love of God pays no attention to a suffered wrong. The love of God says, I will not bring your sin to your remembrance anymore. God is allowing you as a believer to say, I will live this new life of freedom and liberty in the love of God. We're looking at Jeremiah 31, the latter part of verse 34 says, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Well, Pastor Ziegler, if God will not remember my sin anymore, who keeps reminding me and condemning me of my past mistakes? Well, if it's not God, I'll give you one guess who it is. It's the devil. The devil is called the accuser of the brethren. The devil is the one trying to put a jacket of heaviness on you. It's the devil who's trying to cause you to think about all the mistakes you've made in the past and put guilt on you. Arise up in the glory of the light of the word of God. And remember what the word has said unto you. God said, I will forgive their iniquity. Say, I'm forgiven. God has forgiven me of mine iniquity. And he said, I will remember their sin no more. So you stop beating yourself up over the past mistakes. And somebody says, but it's just recent that I made a mistake. Well, I remember Jesus telling the disciples, if a person comes against you and asks for forgiveness, and it's 70 times 7 in a day's time, which is 490 times, do you think God would ask you to forgive others and not forgive you himself? 
You see, the Father God wants you to walk in a attitude that you can always receive the forgiveness of the Father. Somebody says, wait a minute, if I can receive forgiveness like that, what stops me, what hinders me from going out and committing sins? Well, when you really come acquainted with the love of God, when you really are saturated in the love of God and you mature in the love of God, as Paul said, you put away childish things. You know, when a person is constantly tripping themselves up, when a person is constantly having to repent of something that they know they've been delivered from, eventually you'll come to yourself and say, like the, the prodigal son, he's come to himself and he's come to God and he said, I don't need to live like this. This is just not the way my father has taught me. So let me go to my father and tell him I've sinned against heaven and sinned against you, father. So therefore, I'll receive the benefits of knowing you. You know, as a Christian, you don't have to keep beating yourself up. I encourage you not to. I encourage you to receive the forgiveness of God that is acknowledged in the scripture. Highlight this verse of scripture, Jeremiah 31, verse 34. The latter part of it says, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. That means when the enemy, the devil, tries to get you to remember your sin and all the past mistakes, you tell him, shut up, devil, and get up out of here. You're not going to be reminding me and dominating my thoughts with the mistakes that I've made of the past. I am forgiven, and God's not bringing it back to my remembrance. Therefore, I know it's you, and I'm saying you're not going to dominate my thinking. I'm going to allow my thinking to be that which comes from God, and that is he has forgiven me and he will not bring my sin to his mind and my mind anymore. I'm so glad that you have time in the word because learning that lesson will cause you to stand up straight and to show good posture because you can walk thankful that you are really loved by the father. He says, I love you and I'm not condemning you. And I'm certainly not going to remind you of the mistakes that you made in the past. Move forward in the love of God. Let's look at another scripture. Turn over to Hebrews, the eighth chapter, Hebrews chapter eight, and we'll look at verse eight through 10, and then we'll include verse 11. <clears throat> Hebrews eight, and we'll look at verse eight. Hebrews eight, and we'll look at verse eight. Hebrews chapter eight, verse eight, and we'll read our way. Hebrews 8 verse 8 says this, And finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. This is Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10 now. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. Verse 11. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. I love the fact that God says, The love I put in your heart, that love <clears throat> will be shared in, shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. And all of those who believe on the Lord have the same experience. You're born of love. You're love children. We are love children. And therefore, we don't have to say, let me try to introduce you to the Lord after you have received the love of God in Christ Jesus. Everyone who has Jesus Christ in their life, in their heart, would be able to say, I know the Lord. Now, living up to what you know about the Lord demands that you learn and grow, that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. That means when you start finding out about how much he loves you, how he's not bringing your sin to your remembrance anymore, that it's the devil trying to condemn you. It's the devil trying to remind you of all the past mistakes and trying to get you to identify yourself by the mistakes you've made. 
When you found out that it was God that separated your sin from the east as far as the west, that God says, I have cleansed you by my very own blood. It's God that says you are justified in the name of Jesus. When you start thinking about those good things that God says to you, you stop trying to find a way to condemn yourself. And you will not put up with the devil any longer trying to dominate your thinking. Think on what the word of God has declared because you do know the Lord. You're born of love. You're a love child. And so therefore, walk in a way in which you're reminding yourself, I'm a love child. I'm born of love. God loves me. It doesn't matter what other people have said concerning you. I wish that everyone would say something great about me all the time, but everybody doesn't necessarily say that. But that doesn't matter when I think about what my father says about me. My daddy, my heavenly father loves me. And because he loves me and he wants me to mature always and to grow in his love and to be as he is in this world, then I'm so thankful. I'm letting my heart marinate and think on the love of God. So my personality is bold and it's confident because I'm right with God. Because he told me I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am right with God. And as long as I'm right with God, I think I can get along well with others pretty well. Because if God may in me, if the greater one is on the inside of me, if God is on my side and in me, who can be successful against me? So I don't live in fear. I don't live in fear of threats. I don't live in fear of circumstances. And I certainly don't live in fear of bad news because my heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. And that's Psalms 112. Let's look at some more scripture. Turn over to Romans chapter 5 and we'll look at verse 1. Romans, the fifth chapter, read verse 1 and to verse 5. We read this last week, but we'll do it again. Romans chapter 5 and we'll look at verse 1. Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I could stop that right there and just have a shouting attack right now. When I say a shouting attack, I mean get up and just dance a jig. Did you read what we just read in Romans chapter 5, verse 1? He said, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Verse 3, now of Romans 5, verse 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. This means that when we are confronted with challenges, tests, trials, temptations, we can rejoice in the conflict, in the time of challenge, because we know, since God is for me, who can be successful against me? Since God is for me, devil, do you really think you're going to gain the upper hand in my life when God, my father, loves me and is for me? Who can outsmart God who is love and his love is affixed in my heart? And he constantly reminds me he will never leave me nor forsake me. You are a love child of God. And the love of God that's been shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost should be reminding you constantly that I love you and I thank God for you is what I'm saying. I thank God for you. I do love you. But how much more does the father love you and how much more does he want you to be reminded? He'll never leave you nor forsake you. We're looking at Romans chapter five. Let's look at verse four and patience experience. And experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Did you see that? The Holy Ghost has made the love of God shed abroad in our heart so that there's no place in our heart where love is not. Meaning, love is at home in us. And he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. And God is love. And since God is love, 
We ought to rejoice in the love of God, for God is love. Let's look at some more scripture. Turn to Romans chapter 13. Romans the 13th chapter, and we'll look at 8 through 10. Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. Romans 13, 13th chapter of Romans, verses 8 through 10. Owe oh, no man anything but to love one another. Now, that doesn't mean you can't engage in business transactions whereby you are making an obligation to pay for a thing in a matter of time. That's not what he's talking. He didn't say that was wrong. He says, don't be in a position where you owe somebody. And that means you're not keeping your commitment and your obligation that you've made with your vow. Keep your vow. Make sure you don't put yourself in a position where you're constantly outstretched and put yourself in a position where you're making commitments verbally, but you're not able to fulfill them because others are going to make decisions based upon what you have said. And love worketh no ill towards its neighbor. That means if you have a person planning that they're going to get paid by you, but you are not going to fulfill that which you promised to pay, then how dwelleth the love of God on the inside of you? How is that person really going to be giving a lovely appearance to others when they are not being given that which they were expecting? So we're told by the scriptures, owe no man anything but to love him. That means love is a debt or love is an obligation that you will never, ever be relinquished from. Always have this understanding and thought in your heart and mind. I owe love to everyone. I owe love to everyone. Why? Because God first loved me and that's his requirement of me that I have an obligation to love everyone. Now, everyone who claims to be a Christian should have this type of understanding of their obligation. This is the reason why love worketh no ill towards its neighbor, because love considers its impact on others. And if you really are born of God, born of love, then you are not going to look to see what you can do to hurt others. You are willing to help others. You're willing to see others thrive and to grow. <clears throat> if the love of God is really in your heart and abounding in your heart, you're going to be mature and you're going to grow and you'll be ready to handle more responsibility because your faith worketh by love. We're looking at Romans, the 13th chapter, verse 8 again. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Now somebody says, well, what about the Ten Commandments? Are they important? Absolutely. The law was given to show man the right and acceptable way of the Lord. However, he was dealing with people that had stony hearts and that needed to have fresh, fleshly hearts. They needed to have the love of God as the character rather than an unbelieving, unsaved position from the devil that came through Adam's transgression. Now, what we're looking at in Romans chapter 13 is that when we're told to love one another and owe no man anything but to love one another, that means I'm under an obligation from God to express to you the love of God. Somebody says, well, then you better give me the love of God while I'm mean to you. Well, he's not giving you permission to think that I'm going to be a weakling now. I'm going to be the strongest person you ever have met because love never fails and love will never be taken advantage of in, in an overall setting. They thought they were taking advantage of Jesus when they crucified him, but God the Father raised him from the dead and promoted him and set him at his own right hand. And Jesus is now the rule over all in heaven and earth and beneath the earth. So love never fails. They thought they were getting rid of Jesus. You didn't get rid of him, devil. All you did was make it possible for him to be promoted even more. Love never fails. So when I say I'm going to love people and I owe everyone the love obligation that God has given me in my heart, then I'm, I'm not going to be a doormat for people to walk on. I'm simply going to be a person that will give it to you honestly, straight, and with compassion, thinking that one day 
people can grow. And not just one day, all of us can grow in the Lord. And when? Right now. Showing love and compassion to others is my obligation. And the more I mature in the love of God, the more I'm thankful for the love that I have. And that's what motivates me to pray and to believe God for mountains to move. I'm looking at Romans chapter 13 now, verse 9. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery. See, if I love you, I'm not going to commit adultery with you. I'm not going to commit sexual sin with you if I love you. Why? Because the love of God constraineth me and the love of God has already informed me. God does not like ugly. He does not like perversion. He does not like improper sexual behavior. Why? Because it hurts. It hurts maybe not the person who is doing what they're doing. They don't feel it immediately. They think it just feels good. But it's hurting the expectations of others. Don't you know that parents want to see their children have grandchildren? Don't you know that fathers want their daughters to be having a wonderful life with someone that can bring forth a joyful marriage with them? And mothers want their sons to have joyful lives with their wives and be fulfilled? What father wants his daughter to ever be disappointed through a husband that's not sexually uh, committed in their marriage? Or what mother wants her son to have a wife and the wife is constantly not faithful to her son? Everyone knows that there is an expectation of love. When you're a parent, sometimes people misunderstand the parental love with the agape love. The agape love says, I love you because I've decided to love you. And that's it. In other words, I don't love you because you're perfect. I love you because I've determined to love you. But parental love sometimes says, just out of parental protection, I want you to do straighten up and fly right because what you're doing is risky and it will cause danger and things can happen in your life that could possibly hurt the whole family. We're looking at Romans chapter 13, verse 9. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill. And why would he talk about killing? Because if you really love with the God kind of love, you're not running around trying to find a way to kill a person to take their wife. What do you think that King David went through when he killed Uriah and took Uriah's wife Bathsheba? David blew it, and he knows he blew it. He was in a lustful affair with another man's wife. And David recognized, man, I am tripping and doing wrong. And he killed an innocent man. Now, did God forgive him? Of course God forgave him because David asked for forgiveness. And then David said, God, I need a new nature. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Why was David talking like that? Because David recognized, I have the Ten Commandments and the law of God that points out what's right versus wrong. But David was explaining, I need a new nature because the heart that he had was a stony heart. And David said, I need a fleshly heart. Ezekiel talked about it. Jeremiah talked about it. And thank God, Jesus gave us a fleshly heart, a new heart, a heart that knows the law and the love of God. We're looking at Romans chapter 13, verse 9, For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. If there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this, saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. He's letting us know. If you're going to really walk in the love of God, consider what you're doing. How would you want others to treat you. Treat them the way you want to be treated. In other words, if you're living to please God, please expect that you're going to treat others in the same manner. In verse 10, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Romans chapter 13, verse 10. Again, Love worketh no ill towards his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. When we talk about love is the way, we're saying 
You will walk in a manner that is peaceful, blessed, and you will be a blessing if you follow after the love of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, go through that list again. And everywhere it says love, 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 begin to say, I'm in the love of God. The love of God is in me. Therefore, this characteristic of love, I claim it for myself. Because as he is, so am I in this world. I want you to have God's best. Those of you who are watching and receiving information from this broadcast, please continue to turn in and to look at these lessons. Listen to these lessons. The Bible says, take heed how you hear and take heed to what you hear. Hear that which is going to build your faith, that which will add to your faith, that will cause you to walk in a mature love walk so that your faith can produce and move mountains and you will be blessed and a blessing to others. I'm Pastor Gary Ziegler, and I want to encourage you, keep tuning in. Those of you who are watching and say, Pastor, I need my needs met. I've got spiritual things going on in my life, and I've got natural things that are happening in my life that need to be addressed. I need some answers. Well, all that you have need of can be comprehended in this. You should love the way God has commanded you to love. Love in the name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Love as he gave you commandment. And we have that commandment of love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 spelled out. So I encourage you, desire to be a love child. Desire to act like your father who is love. Jesus is Lord. Salvation is the free gift that the Lord offers anyone who would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that with our hearts we believe unto righteousness and with our mouth confession is made unto salvation. I trust that you will believe God's word, that your faith will be in the risen Savior who came to give his life for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Will you pray with me this prayer of salvation? It's not difficult. It's very easy, but you must mean it from your heart. So repeat these words after me. Jesus, I confess you as my Savior and my Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. With my mouth, I confess you and I receive you as my Savior. Jesus, thank you for making my heart your home. Thank you for living in me. God the Father is now my Father and the Holy Spirit has done a work in me. I am a new creature in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Thank you, Lord, for saving me, and thank you for guiding my life. In Jesus' name, amen. We're here to be a blessing to you at Spirit Food Christian Center. The way this broadcast is brought to you is by people's faithful sowing and reaping as a result of God's word being given unto them. So I want to encourage you, be a part of this ministry of sowing and reaping. The Bible says, Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. In this ministry, we believe that man must hear the word of God. For man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The Bible declares, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. God loves a cheerful and hilarious giver. I encourage you. Be a part of this ministry. Be hilarious in your giving and watch the Lord bring it back to you in many, many ways. In Jesus' name. You have been watching the Spirit Food Christian Center worldwide webcast online at www.myspiritfood.com. Join us for worship service each Sunday at 9.30 a.m. And be sure to check out our website for our weekly live broadcast and much, much more. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good.